If you're studying for the INBDE, I highly recommend INBDE Bootcamp, an all-in-one study resource that will help you pass your exam. Use coupon code MENTALDENTAL for 10% off. Hey everyone, welcome back to our oral diagnosis series. My name is Dr. Ryan with Mental Dental, and I hope you're as excited as I am to continue learning about developmental disturbances in the head and neck region. And in this video, we'll talk about developmental anomalies involving the tongue, relating to its size, structure, and overall appearance. So we're gonna start with macroglossia, macro meaning big, and glossia meaning tongue. So this is an abnormally large tongue. And it's associated with a few conditions listed on the left here, amyloidosis, Down syndrome, and hypothyroidism. And I remember these by the simple acronym ADH, which is a hormone. And ADH specifically helps the body retain water. So I think of a water balloon swelling up with lots of water, and it's like this tongue here that's swelling up with lots of tissue. Amyloidosis, in case you're not familiar, is a rare disease that occurs when a protein called amyloid builds up in your organs, one of which is the tongue. So this accumulation of amyloid protein makes the tongue swell up, and it can actually become quite painful. Another association I want you to remember is over here with Beckwith-Weidman syndrome, or BWS, which is a congenital syndrome, meaning it's present from birth, and the syndrome is characterized by an overall large body size, a large tongue size, of course, and hypoglycemia, or low blood sugar. I also use BWS as an acronym, meaning big with swelling, and above average body size with a swollen tongue. Microglossia is the exact opposite problem, micro meaning small, glossia meaning tongue, and it's an extremely rare developmental condition. Supposedly, there are less than 50 reported cases worldwide as of a few years ago. There are probably a few more than that now, but bottom line, it is not common at all. It's not linked to any particular syndrome, but since the tongue plays a crucial role in talking, chewing, swallowing, breathing, and dental development, you can imagine a very small tongue like this one would impact respiration, mastication, and speech functions, to name a few. Also, you can expect things like narrowing of the face, especially a narrow mandibular arch, and some excessive overbite, to name a few of the tooth developmental issues that an undersized tongue could cause. Before we continue, I have to tell you about this incredible AI study tool that will help quiz you on what you're learning in this video, and it's called Wisdolia. It'll give you an outline, flashcards, and even case scenario questions customized from this video. And as you answer the questions, you'll get personalized feedback to tell you exactly what you got right, what you got wrong, and why. You can find the Wisdolia link in the description below. Now, back to the video. Next is ankyloglossia. Ankylo, just like ankylosis, meaning fusion, glossia, tongue. So it's also known as tongue tie, and it's a condition that restricts tongue movement due to a shortened or thickened lingual frenulum. That's the band of tissue that connects the tongue to the floor of the mouth. And restricted tongue movement can interfere with speech, oral hygiene, and feeding. And ankyloglossia can resolve on its own, but sometimes surgery is warranted depending on the severity of the condition and any related symptoms. You may have heard of cleft lip and cleft palate, which we'll talk about more in the next video, but did you know there's also cleft tongue? A bifid or cleft tongue, also called Glossoschisis, glosso meaning tongue, and schisis, like schism, is a split, 
is a tongue with a groove or split along its tip. It's the result of incomplete fusion of the tongue buds during development. And a bifid tongue like this may be an isolated deformity, but has also been reported as an associated finding in orofacial digital syndrome and in infants born to mothers with maternal diabetes. For help remembering these, you can think of M and OR for more, more clefts, more problems. A fissured tongue describes multiple small furrows or grooves on the dorsal surface of the tongue. These folds can be deep, they can be shallow, there can be one, there can be multiple, but usually there is a prominent fissure down the center of the tongue, this deep median groove, and then smaller lateral grooves that branch off from that one. Most of the fissures are found in the middle third of the tongue, and they tend to get worse with age. There's one important syndrome connected to this condition, and that's Melkerson-Rosenthal syndrome. This syndrome involves three things that I want you to remember. Facial paralysis, where the memory trick there is Mel's Bell's, Bell's palsy is another type of facial paralysis, a fissured tongue, of course, where we have this double S, just like in the word fissured, and rosy red swollen lips as a result of granulomatous chelitis, which is lip inflammation involving granulation tissue. So altogether, we have Mel's Bell's facial paralysis, SS fissured tongue, and rosy red lips from granulomatous colitis. And that, in a nutshell, is Melkerson-Rosenthal syndrome. Median rhomboid glossitis is defined as central papillary atrophy of the tongue, specifically atrophy of the filiform papillae. This results in a small, elongated, dark red patch in the mid-dorsal surface or dorsum of the tongue. It's usually asymptomatic and is most often caused by chronic infection with Candida albicans. You'll see it more commonly in diabetic and other immunosuppressed patients who are more at risk for candidiasis, a well-known fungal infection that can affect the mouth. Some cases have been reported involving trauma from vigorous tongue brushing leading to partial loss of the filiform papillae in that region. It's certainly good practice to brush your tongue regularly, but just be careful not to brush it too hard. And since I'm talking about papillae, let me briefly mention the four types. We have filiform, which we're talking about here. Those are the most numerous ones. They're small and conical. They have no taste buds, and they're covered with a layer of keratin, which provides a rough surface for most of the tongue. Fewer in number, they're flat, mushroom-shaped, they do contain taste buds, and they're found mostly at the tip and the lateral borders of the tongue. We have about 20 foliate papillae per tongue, and those are located exclusively on the posterolateral border of the tongue, and they contain lots of taste buds. And lastly, we have about 10 circumvallate papillae. These are the largest ones. They are circular shaped and they form an inverted V shape at the back of the tongue. And they also contain a lot of taste buds. Hairy tongue happens when the filiform papillae grow too long and don't shed that keratin layer properly, where median rhomboid glossitis involved atrophy of the filiform papillae, hairy tongue involves hypertrophy of the filiform papillae. Food, drinks, tobacco, bacteria, fungi, and other substances can get trapped on the papillae and stain them. This makes the tongue dorsum look hairy and gain a brown-black discoloration. Smoking is one of the main contributing factors and poor oral hygiene is another. This next condition is called geographic 
tongue because the patches make your tongue look like a topographic map. Specifically, these lesions consist of white annular rings that surround these central red islands. And these lesions tend to change their shape, their size, and they migrate over time, meaning they move around onto different parts of the tongue, usually restricted to the dorsum of the tongue. Since the patches migrate, this condition is also called benign migratory glossitis and erythema migrans. The red lesions here are once again the result of desquamation or atrophy of the filiform papillae, just like in median rhomboid glossitis. These are usually asymptomatic, but can occasionally hurt and burn. The exact cause of this condition is unknown, but there is thought to be a genetic component. It may also be related to vitamin deficiency or malnutrition, or perhaps an endocrine imbalance. Regardless of the cause though, treatment generally isn't recommended for this condition. Interestingly, geographic tongue and fissured tongue often occur together. Next up is caviar tongue, also known as lingual varicosities or sublingual varices, and it's considered a result of aging. Just like we can develop varicose veins in the leg, we can develop these swollen dark blue or purple veins under the tongue because of gradual degradation of elastic fibers over time. And this condition is completely benign and asymptomatic. Note that it's also normal for veins to be visible underneath the tongue in the first place because the mucous membrane is thin and translucent on that ventral surface. But when they become dilated and tortuous like this, they start looking like these fish eggs over here. One thing is for sure, you'll never look at caviar the same way again. Next is lingual thyroid. And let's talk about the thyroid gland development for a second. As part of its normal development, the thyroid gland actually starts near the back of the tongue, specifically the thyroid originates between the first and second pharyngeal pouches near the base of the tongue. And then from there, it descends down around the hyoid bone and finally below the laryngeal cartilage around the trachea where it ends up. But if it doesn't descend down this embryonic path that it's supposed to, you can get a lingual thyroid, this ball of tissue is ectopic thyroid tissue, and it can produce thyroid hormone and may even be functionally normal, but can also cause some issues. If the mass enlarges, for example, it can cause difficulty eating, difficulty breathing, and difficulty speaking, in which case hormone therapy may be used to try to shrink that tissue back down, or in the most severe cases, surgical excision may be indicated to remove it completely. This condition is much more frequent in females as compared to males. And lastly, we have burning mouth syndrome. This is characterized by a persistent burning sensation on the lips, tongue, gums, or anywhere else within the mouth. It's relatively rare and poorly understood and usually has no known cause. Taste sensation is usually altered as well, and sometimes it can occur with geographic tongue, like you see in this image, and other times it doesn't. It's specifically common in postmenopausal women. While there is no curative treatment for this condition, it can be managed with a variety of approaches. Generally, you want to eliminate any harsh toothpastes and mouth rinses, you can supplement with vitamin B, zinc, and iron in case there's a vitamin deficiency at play here. You can try an antifungal therapy like nystatin or mycelex. Capsaicin, which is a chili pepper extract, can actually be very useful. It serves as a desensitizer or analgesic of sorts. You could consider an antioxidant like alpha-lipoic acid and or treatment with benzodiazepines. 
Since it is a painful condition, hopefully one or more of those options will help to relieve the symptoms for that patient. That's it for this video lecture. Thank you so much for watching. I genuinely appreciate it. I'd also really appreciate if you consider clicking that like button below this video, subscribing to the channel if you have not already, sharing this video with your friends, and leaving a comment below letting me know what you thought. All of those things can really help to grow the channel. If you want to go above and beyond supporting me and what I do here, please check out the Patreon page linked below. If you want to join there, you'll get access to exclusive practice questions, exclusive study guides, a Discord server, and so, so much more. And if you see at the end of my videos, I have an end credits screen, and all of those names there are the names of my amazing Patreon supporters that I'm honored to have. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.